Hello, everyone. It's Jamal Thomas. Welcome to the Progressive Soapbox. So, guys, tonight I have Holly Siegler, the Zuan Politicon. Holly, please introduce yourself and tell the audience hello. Hey, everyone. So, um, we probably have a lot of the same audience. So, I know when I said that I was going to be on Jamal's channel, people were pretty excited. And uh, we talk about a lot of similar issues. I've been running a YouTube channel for about a year and a half. I think it was like a couple months before the crazy election. And I was like, I need to get in on this. Like there's so much crazy news going on and I have thoughts and ideas. And I now seems like the time to start sharing that. And um, I've just been going forward trying to do videos pretty much every day on my channel and then meeting people like Jamal and lots of other people. I don't know what, I don't, I don't know if we're just called like pundits or commentators and you know, our audiences have grown and it's just really interesting to meet YouTube people. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, I, I've hit my head on that particular dilemma myself, right? It's like, what am I? <laughs> Mind you. Oh, you know, defining what you are doesn't necessarily change the thing that you are. But it still, it feels like it's like, all right, what do I call myself? Because to some degree, I think trying to find who you are, is some, you know, it's almost like what mode do I feel, what direction or what path, what's the way forward. I think I ended up on this idea of an opinionist. So it's like um, a YouTuber, yes, but but it's like, yeah, you do YouTube for what? It's like, I give opinions. This is my opinion based on the information. Um, that yeah, I have totally. Available. Yeah, I think opinionist is a great word because it's like, okay, I'm, I'm pundit, you know, commentator. I don't know. Opinionist. Yeah. I mean, some journalism, you know, but people need yeah. to do their own research too. So, agreed. I, I think I started also similar in a similar way that you started, where um, there's something burning in you where you're like, Argh! like, I, I remember annoying the hell out of my wife to do it. Like, the, the, we weren't married at the time. But, like, far too much information, far too much political information, and my thoughts on it. And it's, it's like this kind of, I think, it overwhelmed her. Not to mention family. And at some point, I was like, I need to get this out. Like, I, 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 I'm going to explode on this. I need to get this out. Yeah, and I'm like, uh, you know, my parents and family members and friends were probably just like sick of hearing me talking too. And I was like, you know, I need an outlet for this and like find other people that that have similar thoughts about the election. You know, it was so contentious. I don't know. I mean, a lot of us, we just have like collective amnesia, you know, during that time, especially I, I was following the Bernie Sanders campaign so much and to really see you know, the pain and the strife and everyone just so upset about the whole thing. And then we didn't even know how the election was going to go. And, you know, people were pretty scared there. Yeah, that's true. Uh, scared, pissed off. It was like this combination of everything. I mean, you have one party cheated a guy and you have the other party where a maniac is essentially cutting through the Republican field, like just this massive swath of bodies, you know, to the left and to the right. Yeah. That's an understatement. That's an understatement. Let, let me ask you this. So when you start, it's funny. We started our channel around the same time. I think you started yours a few months before I started mine. Just from a YouTube standpoint, like I, I guess I'm asking, what has been your experience doing this? Saying, because you've been doing this for about a year. What's been your, and I'm asking this more so for my own curiosity myself, just from <laughs> the, to see if your experiences and this is similar. Interacting with your audience, building your audience, um, the content. Have you received any pushback from your content, it, it, if, I'm, if I'm asking this correctly, um, either in your personal life or just on YouTube in general? Um, I think, and uh, I mean, push, yeah. It doesn't necessarily, yeah, pushback is always a bad term. Yeah. But like. For, for example, I remember last time we talked, one of your, you're being attacked by local media in your home state. I, I found it to be amazing. Yeah, I th think um, it, it was strange. I mean, I don't, I've like just surpassed like 6,000 subscribers. I'm like so excited. Like it's been a huge, it's been a really slow crawl. I feel like, I mean, 
I don't know. I, I definitely see that um, it depends on the topic that you talk about. But, um, you know, I think a lot of people, people like yourself and myself and some of these smaller YouTubers were being heavily suppressed. So um, I think that that's kind of difficult because, you know, if you look into all the algorithms, things have really changed even since we started like a year and a half between demonetization and um, they, once you get demonetized, you just don't show up on search results and people will message me and say, hey, I got kicked off your channel. And, you know, it makes me wonder, sometimes I, I usually don't let this happen, but sometimes I'll be like, oh, sh should I censor my shell? Self, should I talk about something or not talk about something to get more views? Yeah. I don't want to do that. Um, my viewers, YouTube people have been really awesome. I mean, uh, sometimes there'll be like a few trolls when I do live streams, but <laughs> I even wonder if they're real people or not sometimes, you know, it's it gets weird. But my audience has been amazing. They've been so helpful. It's like a nice little niche or crew. And I ask people to send me article ideas and stuff they want me to talk about. And that really helps me with cut down on my research time too. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Same here. I, I it's, I, I found it's like you get, um, you build your audience in, in an odd way. It's like just based on the things you should say and everything else. And you have certain people who accrue around you and when they're not trolls, I mean, when you're just dealing with people who accrue around you, there has to be some semblance of you and them for them to even accrue around you. It's like, you know, why, why will somebody come around you if it's not within their, their spectrum? So you end up with this kind of this this safe space of sorts where you, where you can interact with your audience. I, I found it the same way. I feel, yeah, it feels the same way. Wow. So did, have you gotten any more pushback in regards to your outside of YouTube? Like meaning the people, like the articles and everything else, the hit pieces that those guys wrote, has there been any additional issue with that? So um, I'm sure a lot of the audience knows, some people might know, but I've been serving like in super local office for a couple years. And um, I decided to do this YouTube channel, you know, just as my first amendment, right? Blah, blah, blah. And right. uh, yeah, it was like June. Uh, there was a couple of local news outlets that were like, you know, this Holly Seeliger's writing about, it was specifically about the Seth Rich murder. And I've done a ton of videos on the Seth Rich murder. That was like, I think he, that the murder happened like a few months before I started to make videos. So I was heavily following the case as we all have been, you know, on the left and Bernie supporters, just people in general wondering what has been going on for the past, you know, year and a half. And uh, so the local news was like, okay, should we allow this woman who is, you know, speculating and promoting fake news? Should she be serving an office? And, uh, you know, there was some pushback about that. A couple people, mostly people just think I'm crazy though. I mean, it's, I mean, that's kind of what happens when you start to have opinions. It's just what happens anyway. I mean, you probably know you, there's like a certain line that you can't go past with certain yeah. people, you know, or most people. So. Yeah. It, it's weird. It's almost as if I saw, um, Michael Tracy energy interview, the, the guy that works with T he interviewed, Peter Joseph. Now, Peter Joseph was a guy who put out Zeitgeist, the Zeitgeist movement. Joseph, in his very first video, the Zeitgeist film, he would say it anytime. That was an art piece. It wasn't necessarily, he didn't think it was going to be big. He didn't build it with this idea of there's going to be a maths audience. He built it just kind of as his own talent thing. And part of the thing in that particular video, he questioned 9-11. And Michael Tracy, this was like 20 fucking years ago, Michael <laughs> Tracy interviews the guy. And the only thing Tracy could talk about is, well, I mean, you said 9-11 was an inside job. Now, and he, Joseph gets pissed off by this and then kind of confronts him on it. Like, are you telling me that you full well believe everything that's told you? I, you're right. It's almost as if you cross a particular line and people are like, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not the mainstream approved thought. Like you're going somewhere where we told you that you're not allowed to go. And because we told you you're not allowed to go, you're being a conspiracy theorist. 
and you know, you make this kind of very simple point of, do you honestly believe that everything that's ever been told to you is true? And is there such thing where the government will do one thing and lie about it? Like it says, this is the story, and you find out twenty years later, oh no, the government lied. You can find out the whole history. So it's a little, it's it's always weird to me that, and I'm saying this to say, you're right. It's always weird to, for people to take that position of, oh well, you're being conspiracy theorists. It's like, but how can you honestly believe everything that you are told? And if there's previous history that the government will say one thing and have done something else, it it, it just seems. Yes, I, I guess my point is right. That's a long-winded way of saying yes, you're right. It, they, they, people do take issue when you go beyond this idea of just normal, approved, you know, state-sanctioned narrative. They, I, I, Steph the Rich thing was a perfect example. Like, they would be like, oh, you guys are conspiracy theorists. Why? Because we believe that it's possible that a person who worked in the DNC leaked information about the DNC. <sighs> Come on. Come on. I've yeah. seen the Russia, yeah, the Russia gate thing fall apart. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, it, no, yeah, it, you're, right. you're right about like a. Uh, uh, well, we're talking about 9/11. I mean, that was it was so long ago. Like, there's this whole other generation of young people. You know, I think we're calling them, you know, Gen Z or whatever, who are born like after all of that. And then <laughs> there's like you and I who remember it, and uh, yeah. you know, it's. It is one of those things where I, I'm like, yeah, okay, of course the official narrative doesn't make any sense. And it doesn't even really cross my mind that other people don't think that. So, you know, you have to finesse these sort of things. And, uh, yeah. you know, needless to say, like my, my folks and, you know, some people really don't understand where I'm coming from at all, you know, and that's why it's so important that people like you and me and our audience and other people out there try to find each other and be like, hey, over here, you know, we're not crazy. Like, you know, like you said about 20, people find out 20 years later, the official narrative isn't, isn't correct. That happens constantly, you know, whether it's JFK or MLK or, you know, just any, any major thing in US history, you can pretty much look back at the mainstream media and say, wait a minute, okay, they weren't actually telling the truth or it's like 70 30 you know they tell 70 percent of the truth and 30 percent is left out or it's completely wrong you know just and people don't realize and i think i think there are people who realize but then they also there's a fear response and so the fear response is to say oh no you know i can't that will just blow my mind you know my world will collapse if i if i humor this one idea you know, then I'll start questioning everything. And that's just inconvenient for a lot of people, I think, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's fair. That's totally fair. I, yeah, that's fair. Let me ask you this. So you are a green. So I, I know asking this question, I know the answer to this question, but are the Democrats salvageable? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I, it's just like... <laughs> They've got so much money. I mean, they've got lots of money going for, for them. You know, they've got they've got the newspapers in their pockets still, you know, even though the newspapers, mainstream news is completely collapsing, you know, and in some part because of people like us, you know, yeah. there's just a, the, you know, we're like the little thorn in the side that keeps jabbing at them and their facade is starting to fall apart. And, but the Democrats, you know, they they take corporate money, multinational corporations give to them, pay for play. I mean, the Clinton Foundation, all these foundations that can support and uh, promote these elections. And, you know, Democrat Party is still very, very popular where I live. It's a you know one party city. Democrats rule the, par the city. And uh, I don't know, I think there are some people who... It, they just like identify, it's like a sports team or something. They identify with a color or, you know, or a religion or whatever, however you want to define yourself. And some people don't like the idea of having to break from that, that idea of themselves or, you know, I think, I think they, Democrats totally shot themselves in the foot though with the latest like shut down, like how they have yeah. to backtrack on that. That made no sense. Like, I think they're it's going kind of crazy. Yeah. 
it's embarrassing. I, I mean, you you shut down the government saying we're you know we're fighting for DACA, we're like we're fighting for DACA recipients, we're fighting for DACA, and then three days later, okay, we give, we're just playing, we're just joshing, we're just playing, and then turned around and said, yeah, we we did a great job there, we're patting ourselves on the back. It's embarrassing. It is it's embarrassing. very embarrassing. I don't know how anyone could really, you know, justify what happened. I mean, it just it just seems bad. And it's like their base, like there are people who the Democrat pe voters and people like they need social services too. like they don't want their their government shut down, you know, and I definitely feel for the the people, you know, who are under DACA and there, there should be something worked out. But um, I think that using the tactic to to shut down the government and then blame Trump when it was obvious that they were the ones who put in the votes to make that happen. I, I just, I think people aren't falling for the same tactics that they're used to using on people. I'm, I'm thinking people are starting to become more, more nuanced about uh, politics. Yep. I don't know. Do you, well, okay. So that's interesting. Do you believe they should have shut it down at all? Do you believe that's not a tactic that should have been used in regards to trying to protect the DACA recipients? Um, so I know, I think it was 2013, the government had a shutdown. I don't remember yeah. who decided to do oh, that. If it was Republicans. Obamacare. Okay. Republicans. Yeah. Over Obamacare. Obamacare. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think it was pretty much like the same thing. Like it's like tit for tat. And, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that just because the government gets shut down, they still get paid. Like, I don't oh, yeah. think they're losing Joe, any of their yeah. services. So, you know, I Joe think- Joe Manchin wanted to- Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Joe Manchin was looking, I think Joe Manchin tried to pass a bill saying that people shouldn't, a congressman shouldn't get paid while the government is shut down. Uh, of course, that's not going to go anywhere. Those guys still want to get paid regardless. Yeah, I mean, they're not going to lose their health benefits or, you know, their pay or anything. Nothing's going to happen to them at all. And they always exempt themselves, you know, like when it came to Obamacare or whatever, they don't, they're exempt from all of that. It's, yeah, that that's, yeah, unfortunately they are. I actually like that bill by Joe Manchin. If they shut the government down, they should pay for it. Um, that said, I do... All right, this is, the, okay, so this is interesting. So I do, I understand the point that the um, Obamacare shutdown, I thought the Obamacare shutdown was stupid. Yeah, ultimately, you're talking about getting rid of health care for, you know, God knows how many people or trying to shut down or getting a president to repeal his own achievement, which is, you know, bearing his name. He's not going to repeal his own legislation. The DACA thing, ugh, that's different to me. The DACA thing is a little bit different to me because they're talking about kicking out real human beings out the country itself. And so it's like, what is the tool that Democrats have at their disposal? And if Republicans had already used that particular tool, meaning they pulled that particular quiver out, is it wrong or is it malicious to use that quiver also? And, and I'm going to phrase this as a question. Is that a bad thing to do at that point? And if so, why? Hmm. So, um, yeah, I can definitely see where you're talking about, like, breaking families apart. Um, you know, that's that's something that I certainly don't want to have happen. Um, I just I just see the Democrats as disingenuous. You know, like if I truly believe that they were working for immigrants or um, were doing more to bring families together or you know, improving paths to legal citizenship, or I don't know, I just know, know that like Democrats love to use, like, uh, you know, they love to pander to certain groups in order to get the votes that they need. And then they, they guarantee people the world. And then, you know, when push comes to shove, they're going to go after their corporate base and support their corporate base first and foremost, you know, Absolutely so agree. you have yeah. a great point, though, about, you know, um, the fact that families are going to be broken up over this and uh you know what can we what can we do we need to work on this as as a nation and i agree with you by the way i democrats are extraordinarily disingenuous on this i mean you know obama was in office they had state and senate i mean i'm sorry senate and the house and didn't do squat on this issue essentially using this purely as a political stunt 
let, let me actually there's something that you said the seth rich thing when you kind of made the point that um about indie journalists you're so right you're so so right i I, for a while, I think the first eight months I was doing this, I thought, is anybody really ever paying attention? Like, is this, you know, just screaming in an empty forest? Or, or is this, or is there actual <laughs> people out there? Like, is there some impact? And I remember this local, me like media, like, like big media companies started turning their attention to the Seth Rich thing. And they kept over, over and over and over. I mean, they were writing in the paper, like Washington Post, whatnot, attacking indie journalists on this issue and you realize oh somebody is listening like there is no reason that you would attack indie journalists there's no reason why you would go after nobodies and has been with people who don't matter in this way unless those people were having some kind of impact so it's like that that was my feeling on this uh, was that did you get that same sentiment? Because they you, kept bringing yeah. this issue up. You were exactly here. right. Like uh, that that was the only time, like I think I had like 2000 subscribers at that point. Like I would get a couple hundred views or whatever on my, on my videos. I was just flying under the radar. And then all of a sudden, you know, like these two, two big papers are suddenly like, what calling me up saying, I want to talk to you about your YouTube channel. And I want to talk to you about Seth Rich. And they both wanted to talk about Seth Rich. So I'm wondering if there was some sort of, uh, you know, a memo from higher up saying like, we need to start doing damage control on this story <laughs> right now, you know, because it was like you and me and H.A. Goodman and um, Tim Black and like a ton of people like, and then on the right, there was, you know, uh, Matt Couch, America First Media, and I don't know, Cassandra Fairbanks. There was like a ton of people who were really, really at it and people going around and interviewing witnesses and creating this timeline. And the mainstream media was just like, uh, nope, he just got shot. You know, it was botched robbery. Um, his family says, don't look into it. And, uh, you know, the DNC put up a bike rack in Washington, DC, <laughs> Seth Rich Memorial <laughs> bike rack, seriously. So, you know, they were like, end of story, you know, that's the end of story unsolved mystery, you know, and all of us were like, no, what about this? What about this? You know, and then Sean Lucas and then Barrington Wiseman and then the DNC fraud lawsuit. And it's just this really amazing story if you try to follow the whole thing. And I think, I think you're totally right about Seth Rich. That story really set off the alternative media in that moment, because I think it was the first time that uh, the mainstream narrative and, you know, DNC run media, major media was like, wait, we're not controlling the narrative right now. We need to, you know, we need to cut and break this down really quick. And, and uh, if, you know, in fact, after all of that, like I gained like a thousand subs or whatever after yeah. that happened. So, you know, all's well that ends well. And I'm still putting out videos on the topic. So, you know, it's not going away. <laughs> no, it's, I, I don't think it's going away. I, particularly with the guy, um, with the Arwan brothers or something like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's working his way through court. It's like, you just can't get rid of it. It's corruption under corruption. Um, I asked if the Democrats can be saved. Can the Greens be saved? That's, that's the yeah, follow-up. That's, that that's the real question, right? Huh? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's hard. I mean, can any, can any political system be saved? I mean, we are just at a very, very difficult point right now. And I think, you know, there was a few months ago that mainstream news is really going after Jill Stein. And like, you know, they said that she was a Russian agent. They've had like yeah. a photo of her like at an RT dinner or something. And they're like, this is it. This is the proof. And they made that out to be bigger than like, you know, Clinton Foundation and Uranium One scandal, like the Clinton and pay for play, like Hillary Clinton as head of the State Department gave 20% uh, of uh, US uranium to a Russian company. Like that doesn't sound like pay to play for you, but Jill Stein sitting at a table, you know, at our, our RT dinner with, um, you know, lots of other politicians, you know, they're not going after those other politicians. Um, I think it was just, you know, I, I, and the greens we've, it's just, it's hard. Like I'm still working on, I'm, 
Um, locally, I'm starting up the Portland Green Party. We're going to do our yearly caucus. We are going to run someone for governor. Um, nice. A friend of mine is going to run for office. Like, you know, people need to look out local offices, like super local. If you want to try something different, you know, trust me, it works. If you have, have the time or the desire or you can recruit someone else doing any sort of there's still a lot of control in local politics and how you use your local tax dollars. Hmm. All right. Nice. Uh, okay. Fair enough. Can, can the Greens be saved? I love that. I, inevitably, anytime we're talking about the third party, the issue, people bring up the Greens. And I, I, I voted for Jill Stein. And, and I, I always tell them that the issue with the Greens is not like part of it is the name. You know, this idea of tree huggers, and that's kind of the way it comes across, even though their platform is larger than that. But part of it is also this thing of, there, there are a few reasons for the Greens. They're not going to go into the, the Greens thing. That's kind of the best point. <laughs> the, let me ask you this, though. I, I sat in on the meeting. I think it was at the left forum where the Greens were talking about whether or not to collect dues. How, th this seems to be a fundamental problem or question. How do you run? into political office if you don't have the capacity to raise money. And then the argument that Democrats make is, well, we need to take corporate money, et cetera, et cetera. But the Greens are doing an odd thing. It's like, do we collect dues? And it's same token, we're not going to take corporate money. How do you raise money in this case? That's a great point. Yeah, I'm still, I'm, I'm torn on that in a lot of ways, you know, because I want to be able to hold meetings locally. And I, you know, don't want to tell people I'm like, okay, you can't come and sit in on the meeting if you don't give us $5 or whatever, you know, like that's, you know, most people who are independent or third party or green, you know, we're not forking over a bunch of money to help start up a party. Um, but at the same time, you know, how do you even run for office at that point? It, it's expensive between science and literature. And if you're going to do phone calls or if you're going to go to doors, you know, uh, even TV ads, so expensive, all the stuff that actually makes a campaign work. Um, I know in my state, we have something called clean elections, which is super rare. And it's when uh, people donate $5 checks towards the clean elections fund. And then it, it is um, doubled by um, a savings account through the state. So it's very popular for Democrats and Greens and even independents, even some Republicans do clean elections because Maine, we have like this idea of trying to keep big corporate money out of out of our state politics. And, you know, it's hard. It's hard to keep that going. There are people who try to put in laws to try to break it apart. Um, we're also trying to do rank choice voting uh, in Maine. Yeah, and that's been uh, it's been suspended by like the it, Democrats and Republicans took took it to court. So we got ranked choice voting wow. on the ballot through a referendum, and it I went, wanted to talk about that. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So it passed the like we it passed pretty well like with Maine voters, and then Republicans and Democrats were like, "Oh, this violates the Constitution." So somehow I think it's a BS claim, but. They're stalling it in the courts and they want to make sure that it gets stalled until after the governor's race this this coming year. So that's where we're at. I know uh, it's been passed in some local towns, but no, Maine was the first state to actually pass that ranked choice voting. That's awesome. I, I, and I remember I actually saw this video you did of this where you were talking about, like you say, they took it back. Essentially, it was passed by referendum. The people themselves passed it. And the legislature undid the referendum. Is that what you, is that what took place? Like, what was, because I understand why Democrats and Republicans don't like this. I mean, ultimately, if you have two parties, you force a person to make a choice. If the person can choose a third choice, then it screws with their political calculus. So Democrats can't say they're least worse anymore. And Republicans can't just be the opposition party. You have a third party in this mix, meaning people may vote for somebody else comforted by this idea that if the person who they vote for doesn't win, that they'd very least vote for also somebody else. So from a Democratic standpoint, they're going to hate it because this idea of least work. So somebody could say, I want Jill Stein as my first choice and I want whoever else is my second choice. 
well, right off the bat, you've just incentivized somebody to vote for a third party. They undid this. I mean, is that what took place? Like, how did they go about doing this? Um, so they basically said uh, the Democrats and Republicans, the legislature, it was bipartisan right. effort. They said, OK, this referendum violates something in the main constitution that um, lets political parties, you know, gives them some sort of uh, I don't know. It was I need to look it up. It has something to do with referendums interfering with political parties i i think the claim wow. is totally bs so they appealed to the main state courts and you know it's going to have to go through all the courts now the court system in the meantime though we have like 20 candidates at least lined up running for um running for governor this year so i'm starting to think that republicans and democrats have this tactic where they're just going to flood the ballot with like a million of their people and you know I, because that's and none of these people are good at all like none of it they're all just like they're total hacks so yeah. they keep throwing names out like every few weeks there's a new person that they're like what about this person what about this person and then if rank choice voting doesn't happen then they will um sorry my bird is yelling in the background sorry about that oh they're <laughs> fine they're fine <laughs> sorry Don't audience. Bother me yeah. So they're, I think they're just hoping if they keep throwing people at the at the uh, ballot, then um, people just get confused or check out. They don't know. They're scared right now if ranked choice voting goes through. Yeah, I think they're terrified of ranked choice. I mean, I look, personally, I, I think it's an awesome idea. It, we, The goal of an election, at least from the standpoint of the population, is not for one of the parties to win. The, you know, it's like Democrats and Republicans have no claim to this apparatus. I mean, it's for whoever works in the interest of the public itself. So I love this idea that that gives the public a certain amount of power back or the certain amount of, because because I can understand if you're going to the voting booth and you're like, oh my God, that other guy's a maniac. And no, I don't like this particular person, but <sighs> the other guy's a maniac. And so you're shamed to some degree or, or, you know, it's like a gun to your head. And so you end up voting for the Democrat with a gun to your head. Ranked choice at least says, well, I'm going to vote for the person I want. So I want the Green Party member to win. And if that Green Party member doesn't win, I can vote for this other weaker candidate. So no, I love it, man. I love the idea. I, I, it seems like somewhat of a bogus thing unless they're going to try to say, well, this interrupts our state we need to undo it so maine needs to fight like tooth and nail to keep that in place let me ask you this how long have you been a russian agent <laughs> that's what i want to know how long have you been working for Vladimir? <laughs> yeah <laughs> Does <he pay> well? <laughs> i think my studio would be a lot nicer i think they would hook me up with a better <laughs> studio maybe a soundproof room or something i don't know they would have given me yeah. a better, better setup and maybe someone who can do some editing for me and promote my stuff. And I definitely have a lot more subs and shares and likes and all that. That's for sure. So, you know, it can be hard talking about the topics that we talk about, you know, because it's it just gets to the point where it's like, OK, you know, where's the border of sensationalism too? Right. you know, right. so it's a. Uh, you know, I don't, there rarely, there are a few times where people have been like, you're incorrect about this. And like, I think they were right. And, you know, I try to try to fix what I can when I make mistakes, but you know, it's, it's a small crew, you know, it's a one, one woman show. So you know, there's no, no Russian influence over here. I know recently they had like on Twitter, they they were like, oh, you get an email that said like, oh, you shared a Russian tweet yep. or a Russian memes or something. I was like looking for it, like in my mailbox. I'm like, oh, I haven't shared any Russian memes yet, I guess. I don't know. I'll I was, have to look for I it. Was like, <laughs> I was saying the same thing. I was like, damn it, I didn't get my Russian email. <laughs> I didn't have one from Twitter. <laughs> this is like you've been sharing Russian information. What do you think about this? I mean, this seems pretty outrageous to me, but what do you think about the shadow banning, and, and it, again, I, I asked this question knowing the answer to some degree. I just want you to kind of get your opinion on this whole thing. The shadow banning from Facebook, Twitter, why do you think they're doing it? I, I guess, how am I asking this? 
what is the reason you think they're doing it? Let me let me say it that way. And what do you think about it? And have you been adversely affected by it? It's been going on for quite a few years, I think now. Um, so I probably got onto Facebook like 2008 or something like that, maybe, maybe 2009 or something. And I was, uh, you know, and like my sibling had been on Facebook since like 2004 and whatever. So I guess those were like the heydays or something. I was still on MySpace, but Facebook, it used to really be like, you were interacting with people constantly sharing photos. I would see like everyone, whatever one would post. And I've seen slowly and slowly, it's like the number of people I see on the stream gets gets cut. And so now at this point, I see like the same like four people now. And I just know so much of it is, is shadow banned. You know, I've tried to post uh, topics on, you know, geoengineering and that, you know, wouldn't share or get lost or, you know, it's definitely seems like there are some stuff that you cannot put out there. And I know, you know, people see that on Facebook all the time. I don't think I've, I don't really use Twitter too much. So um, I haven't been like banned or really messed with yet. Um, but I've definitely seen it on Facebook and it's, and it's sad to see. And I've seen some of my friends get kicked off, you know, and I know people like Debbie, the same progressive and Claudia yeah. from cabin talk haven't been able to stream. Like I really yeah. like streaming on Facebook. I, I reach a different audience and some people have really built up their channels that way. Um, but I'm uh, honestly, I'm kind of afraid to do videos on there. Like I, I really do think you can get in trouble on there now. You know, they, they yeah. want to give, uh, and, Form the police if you're suicidal and like all this really strange stuff on there. I I personally, you know, I'm far out there, but I think Facebook is more of a social experiment than, uh, you know, a business. So I think that they will sacrifice, you know, viewership and uh, enjoyability or promotion in order to make sure that fake news isn't spread, you know, AKA their narrative. Mm. No, that's fair. It, it, yeah, their narrative. I, and you always have to ask that question of what's pushing their narrative. Um, I've become somewhat cynical of American politics. And I, I don't make a distinction between, like, I don't make a distinction between the, 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 the business interests and the politics of it, because I don't think you can make a distinction between those things. Do you believe that Facebook, Twitter, and, and this is my own pet, my own pet theory that these guys work in the benefit of a party do you believe they're doing this in protection of a particular party or do you think they're doing this in protection of just mainstream thought if that makes sense it's like if you think of mainstream thought from the standpoint of these are the approved narratives that we're going with or these are the narratives that assist this particular party if that makes sense yeah, that's a that's a great uh, great thought. You know, I I wonder if it's basically just like, uh, you know, Facebook is owned by Google, is owned by Alphabet. I'm pretty sure. So maybe it's just like the highest bidder. You know, I, I don't. I mean, similar to what they're saying about Russia paying for Russian memes and propaganda, like maybe Facebook has some deals with some companies or some governments or some political parties. And, you know, this gets promoted. This doesn't, you know, this topic can be talked about and shared and can be trending. Like we've seen, we know that all that stuff like trending on YouTube even and some other, other platforms, Twitter, is contrived to like they promote they purposely promote what they want up there so i i don't know i think the democrats have taken a very strong stance on trying to keep their their media presence uh strong and positive and i think they spend a lot of money on that i'm sure republicans do the same thing too i mean if you look into the history of the cokes the Koch brothers and all the media that they own you know it's very uh I think we're just going to see, like, I think it maybe started a little bit with the Obama election in 2008. Like, it was one of the first social media uh, campaigns that like, he started to promote social media through the Obama campaign. And I think every single election after that, they've put more and more into needing an online presence. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I think both parties 
Hillary Clinton raised what, like a billion dollars or over a billion dollars. And that money gets dumped mostly in like television ads. And so from the television standpoint, I understand the way that television is obsequious to the parties. I, I, I always took it as Facebook, Google, these tech companies were more associated with the Democratic Party. So they tend to lean a particular way in regards to cutting off certain content. Um, has Trump made America great again yet? And will Trump make America great again? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, I will say that I did do a video the other day about him. Um, you know, he, between Bernie Sanders and Trump, they both agreed they had a bo very strong populist lean. And I think that's ultimately what pushed Trump into into the uh, election was that, you know, there were people were interested in populism and uh, Trump's really promoting like this America first thing. So first thing that he did pretty much as soon as he was in office was to kill the TPP for America. And that's what Bernie Sanders was about, too. And that's that's what I'm about as a green. You know, I know NAFTA was a total, you know, it was a it was a total sham. It was bad for this country. It doesn't matter who signed it. I think the only reason why Democrats like it is because Bill Clinton signed it. You know, if a Republican president had signed NAFTA, they'd be against it, you know? So yeah. it's, um, I think we need to look at that sort of stuff. I mean, I don't know if he's actually going to like renegotiate NAFTA or anything. I, I don't like his style. Um, I think it's hilarious that he trolls people on Twitter. I don't know if like the next president should do that though. You know, like if we're going to expect <laughs> them to be trolling people on Twitter now, like it's kind of weird. He's, it's definitely so surreal. It's like the celebrity pr president, president, you know, we yeah. get, I guess we get what we ask for. You know, we've basically become a joke, you know, it's sad. Like we live in a country that's completely, uh, you know, reality television. Literally, that's what we're living right now. It's utterly bizarre. <laughs> like it is completely bizarre. I, I've seen. I don't. I don't like Trump. Everybody knows at this point. I, but I've his tweets are hilarious to me. Like, like you say, he's intentionally trolling. It's the president of the United States trolling people on Twitter, and there's. Nothing more insignificant than than a tweet, and and uh, and usually there's nothing more insignificant. And yet, when the president of the United States sends it, it becomes this almost like policy, like it's like Donald Trump talking directly to his audience through Twitter, hundred or two hundred some words at a time. It's bizarre. I agree with you, man. It is so bizarre. Um, I don't I, really know if like he's gonna like save the country or anything though. I mean, just from like the idea of like the presidential seat, you know, I mean, we need we can't rely on a person to save America. And anyone that thinks that that's the way things are going to go, like as we all know, if someone starts to really speak out to to the powers that be, you know, a la President Kennedy, people get shot in the head. You know, let's not mince words here. So, you know, I think uh, he, Trump definitely has uh, corporate interests in mind and uh, whether or not he wants them to be American corporate interests or foreign corporate interests is probably like the best that we can uh, wish for. Yeah, I agree with you. I, The people who, um, you know, it's funny, I think when, Obama was running. I think you had a lot of people who were like, oh, my God, this, you know, this is this is the FDR revolution and all this other stuff or this this new FDR. And he gets in office and you're like, oh, not so much. That's totally so what much. happened to me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like not so much. And then Donald Trump comes in and right wing is like, oh, here's the right wing revolution. And then it's Donald Trump. Now, in their mind, the way Donald Trump ran this campaign, you it, it's weird because Donald Trump ran to the left, like significantly ran to the left. He, he in some degrees, were outlefting Hillary Clinton in a weird way. You know, this was with ten dollar minimum wage. Um, he was talking about health care, big beautiful health care for everybody, and all this other just insane stuff. And right wingers ate the stuff up, completely missing the fact that Obama had did the same thing on the left. And Trump gets in office, and he is completely opposite of what he ran in the campaign. And it becomes, all right, guys, in the same way that you saw lefties 
let down with Obama? Can you see the similarities with with Trump? Have oh my gosh, I never thought of it that way. You're totally right. Well, Obama ran on this hope and change thing, and Donald Trump is just make America great again. They're just cut for different audiences, but the language is the same. This idea of change, um, you know, renewal. You know, we're going to focus on America. All this stuff. I mean, ultimately, right wingers looked at it and thought, you know, this is our guy. But the stuff that Trump ran for wasn't right wing stuff. This idea of, of of that Paul Ryan and all these guys have that this is what right wingers want. He didn't run on that at all. Donald Trump ran against the Republican Party right when he took office. And it's like he's the opposite of what he ran. And I always ask this question to my right wing, you know, people who are on the right wing is like, certainly you can see the similarities here where you guys are being had. Have you gotten to the point where you realize your truth been had? I don't know if they've seen it yet. Um, do you think they will see it and what would happen when they see it? Meaning, do you think those angry, pissed off people are going to flip out? And and not just that, and just to add an extra question to it, do you think they're going to be able to impeach Trump? And if they impeach Trump, meaning if they drag him out that office, what would be the social impact of that? I just... The first of all, the whole impeachment thing is absolutely ridiculous. Like, like you said, with the government shutdown, like I think it's just kind of like this tool that they they try to drag out once in a while and like try to convince their base. You know, like I for some reason I get like these Democratic Party like pamphlets in the mail like constantly, and they're like donate five dollars so we can impeach Trump. Like it's <laughs> it's only about like I'm like come on, like and it works though. It's sad. It's like people are like yeah, let's go get them, and they send five dollars out, and you know it doesn't it doesn't mean anything. And they're going after like his his sanity. Like there's like some sort of 24th amendment or I don't know what it's called but there's something where it's like you can be unfit for office like that's all complete distraction and yep. you're 100% right that um there seems to be like this overlap I mean Trump used to donate to the Democratic Party like on, on a massive yeah. scale you know and then he just kind of like became a Republican all of a sudden and um you know for whatever reason if you thought it was just a calculated risk or you know, and people people don't even notice that sort of stuff. Like you said, Obama had this platform that was, you know, he never followed through on like any of it pretty much. And Trump, you know, probably isn't going to follow through on, on much of his platform either. But the overlap there, like um, one of someone in the chat said it was it's about populism. Like that's the yeah. and they're what's going on is we're constantly convinced it's red versus blue and Democrat versus Republican. And when this country was founded, it wasn't about political parties. You know, that's slowly how it's become. And we've been totally duped for 150 years. It's been Republicans and Democrats now. So it's time for them to die. <laughs> and, I don't, and I don't mean that in like a physical way at all. I just mean like <laughs> people need to stop giving their money to them and giving their support and registering as them and believing that these parties give a shit about you. I'm sorry, pardon Reed. my language, but um, they care no, about your language, right, right. No, right. Your language. And, you know, because once you start to actually look at the issues, which is difficult, most people don't want to look and do their own research. They just want to go into the ballot box if they have the time, you know, if they can get time off of work to go vote and, you know, check off and vote down the line and feel like they did something good. And it's it takes a lot more work if you want to actually look at the issues. Agreed, agreed, so agree. I I agree with everything in that statement. I don't pardon your language. That language should be far stronger if we're talking about those parties. Um, I, do you think that there's areas where the left and right can get to work on? And by left and right, I mean the actual. I always say people that actually believe in things, meaning people who actually have principles, not like you said, the party thing, put the party thing to the side. People who are consider themselves on the left, people consider themselves on the right. Are there areas where we can work in tandem and work together? And if so, what are those areas? 
Well, I, th I think it's fascinating. Like you, you and I both voted uh, the for the Green Party this past year. And for me, the selling point, you know, was the idea of the Green New Deal. So I really liked the idea, you know, let's bring our war dollars home or at least a chunk of it. I mean, come on, like the next largest country to, to with their um, the amount of military spending is just, it's uncomparable. Like we, we, uh, triple spend, you know, we outspend everyone by a massive amount of money and so much of that money. Like I did a video recently, like so much of it just disappears like into the Pentagon. Like there's missing trillions of dollars that can't yeah. be accounted for. I mean, we need to start bringing this money out of these big groups like the Pentagon and all these shadow government organizations that we basically throw trillions of dollars at and sell out our country. We could be using that to repair our roads, our infrastructures. You know, I think I think I still think in a lot of ways, like states, states need to have control over their budgets more like we defer to the federal government constantly. And that's Washington. And people hate Washington, like there's no confidence in any of the representatives in Washington. And I think that's where the right and the left can start to come together. Like, what are we doing? You know, people, what are we doing in our in Iraq and Afghanistan and Yemen and, you know, Somalia, and we're going to Africa and Syria and uh, Pakistan, like what is going on? And there was one interesting thing, I, I think it's double edged sword that Trump was limiting, uh, he put a tariff on a uh, Whirlpool uh, dishwasher, like foreign dishwashers. And uh, he put a tariff on Chinese solar, solar panels. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of like he, I, I'm don't I don't I know how it. it's gonna yeah I'm, I'm not sure how it's gonna play out because Democrats are like he hates solar power now but <laughs> it could actually end up that we start building more solar panels in the U.S. and that's our saving grace I think we need to start working on becoming energy independent via alternative energy you know rebuilding our infrastructure focusing on what needs to get fixed here in the United States. Like we all know things are completely falling apart right now. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it $5 trillion was missing in the military budget. $5 trillion with the T. Like that number is mind blowing. Like it's hard to put your head around that number. And, you know, it's like, well, wait a minute. You guys lost like five, six trillion dollars. And Bernie Sanders is asking for $80 billion for college. It's like, are you shitting me? It's like, are we really having this conversation on whether or not we should pay for college or a single, a single uh, pair? And you guys have spent five trillion dollars. You don't even know what that money is. That's like, it's not a rounding error. Like, it's not, you know, like you lose a few pennies out of your pocket. It's five trillion dollars. It's a fucking amazing amount of money. Um, yeah, I agree with you, man. I, I full on agree with you. But, so, it, to get into a little bit weirder topics. Some garden was like, get get esoteric topics, bring up esoteric topics. New York Times, Politico, and I think it was Washington Post all came out with an article saying that the federal government was studying aliens or the Pentagon was studying UFOs, area of phenomena. What's your take on this? That I find this to be weird and interesting. And not just weird and interesting. I find it weirder in regards to the public's response. What's the what does it look like to bring aliens into our political mix mix i don't know you got you got me there so uh <laughs> i'm torn on this issue for sure because um i have some viewers and friends people who are like you got to start reporting on all this alien stuff and <laughs> you know like and it's true i will say this is one thing i had i've been wondering about like with sensationalism like i know some channels that started up maybe a year ago and they start doing alien vids and they've got like a hundred thousand subs you know oh, they talk about deep space program and you know uh ufos and uh space technology and alien visitors and you know people love that stuff you get so many views with that but i'm just i i think it's weird like i think um the, when I first started to hear about some of the, the UFO talk and whatnot, um, 
there was a John Podesta email that was talking about yeah, aliens. A lot. Of yeah. John Podesta like, and probably. so this is when things kind of get weird. So it's like, I wonder if it's something like in the wings, like there was something, there's supposedly something called project blue beam, I believe it's called. And it's basically like the plan where they want to roll out like the alien story where there's like, you know, a big, big, terrible invasion coming in. We all need to work together and uh you know one world government style to fight these aliens and even reagan talked about that he would be there's a, a famous reagan speech where he's like you know uh i wasn't how will unite if yeah, we I, were attacked by aliens yeah how how what, I, I can't remember the exact quote it's like but how all of the problems of the world would fade if we realized it was a threat from outside our borders or something like that yeah. yeah, so I'm not yeah. saying that like aliens don't exist or space technology doesn't exist. I mean, we were just talking about all the trillions of dollars that went missing. Like where where could it be? Could it be a moon base? Could it be an underground base? Could it be geoengineering? Could it be, you know, multi-dimensional technology? Like, I don't know. I mean, who knows? Like, I I think we're all kind of aware that technology is at least 50 years ahead of what we ever get to find out, you know, the average person. So, you know, I'm not saying that this alien stuff isn't, you know, people don't actually have experiences, you know, I'm not going to tell people that they're foolish. But when I start seeing someone like John Podesta being like, we really need, need to get on this alien thing, you know, I'm wondering He's if that, that could, yeah, it could be like yeah, the next but, distraction. I mean, it's perfect. Podesta but, was into it, man. Podesta, <laughs> even during the Clinton administration, Podesta was like, Full on. He, he wow, really? That, yeah, he said something like, um, the biggest regret of, of my tenor at this office was not getting the files released. And this was like going like way back, like 20 some years ago. Even um, pushing for Obama to release the files. Hillary Clinton comes out saying she would open the books herself. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she, she was David. She was caught walking with a book, with an alien book. There was another time where in the Podesta leaks, she was at Jimmy Kimmel to ask her about the alien question, to bring up the fact, you know, ask her about aliens. And Hillary Clinton was like, they're now called UFAPs or something like that, unidentified area phenomena. Um, yeah, he was full on. Like he, Podesta was full on into it. I, I, It's hard to know what it means because he would say, you know, we're working to get this open. We're working to get this release. We're trying to, and over and over throughout the emails themselves, it comes up where people are either talking to him, um, sending him information about it, or he himself was responding to information related to it, including the release. So the guy who's um, the guy who secured the release of the stuff was Blink eighty two singer, the the singer oh, for yeah. Blink eighty two. <laughs> it's so fucking bizarre. It's like the singer for Blink one eighty two um, is a UFO buff. And he's he's like he said he would call people up and say, "Hey, I'm just looking for you, on Blink 182." And because he was a celeb, the people would kind of bring him in. Eventually, he found the right people. Those people brought him in, and they started giving him information about the subject. And so he's trying to start a company selling alien stuff and exposing the public, exposing the stuff to the public. He, I shit you not, it's called what is it, to the Stars Academy. And I'm not laughing at I'm not laughing at him. I'm just laughing at the weirdness of this. Like it's so bizarre. Like you're you're talking about a singer for Blink 182 interacting with people in the US government, including like these military personnel. And they thought he was full of it until the stuff started being released. And he had said this stuff was going to be released months and months and months ago. And it started to trickle out. It's so bizarre. Yeah, I just I'm I'm glad that we're kind of on the same page about it because I know there there have been people like viewers who are like, you know, report you got to report on this. I mean, there have been weird sightings of like the strange orbs and all this stuff and then they were yep. like, "Oh, that's a SpaceX rocket and this and that." And like, you know, it it definitely seems very strange like people have heard strange sounds you know i don't know if it's aliens i don't know if it's like a interdimensional portal being ripped open i mean none of this stuff is like you know i can't exactly report on it with any sort of certainty yeah. you know? <laughs> there's there are a few guys who i um I looked to for stuff like this, like guys who are, I guess, in this particular industry or this particular thing. 
I, I always approach it from the standpoint that I don't know. I, 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 I am, I mean, I, I don't believe that we're alone. I think it would be insane to believe that we're alone. Um, Cause at that point that's more of a religious thing, meaning that, you know, only us formed. Um, but I, I found this to be amazing. I, I, I watched this report on CNN and as the CNN host asked the guy who Alejandro, that's his name. She was like, so she's like flabbergasted by this. She's, she doesn't even know how to deal with the story. And she's like, so do you believe they're, they're, they're actual aliens? And he says, in my scientific opinion, I can't speak for the U.S. government, but the answer is yes. Now, I watched this thinking to myself, oh, my God, these guys just disclosed that they're fucking aliens. And I was like, what is the rest of the world going to do? What is the rest of the world going to do? And there was crickets. Like, I, I, I'm listening to a guy who's from the U.S. Pentagon make this statement. And I'm like, what is, oh, oh my God, this, these guys are just close. Um, so is there anything that you want to tell the audience or anything that's been coming up that you want to have a discussion about in general? I'm a lead, I'm, I always ask this question as an open thing to the person who I'm interviewing because I don't necessarily know if there's something that they themselves want to get out. Oh, wait, wait. I can't hear you. We can't oh. hear you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> just one last thing about the aliens, just because that, that was just such a funny topic to throw in at the end there. Um, I, think, I love the yeah, topic. Yeah, exactly. I think <laughs> It's been going on, what was it, 1947 was like Roswell or something. So, it's, yeah, you know, time, yeah. it's, you know, since our grandparents age, like this idea of like aliens and beings from outer space, you know, crashing oh, down in the U.S. Oh, you know, it was right. way before, before that. that. Like, yeah. Yeah, Mana, in India, like the thousands and thousands of years ago, these guys are talking about building rocket ships. Yeah. And those were way, way before that. But and there's I know like the, like there was war of the worlds which was uh orson wells radio drama and you know d you know the aliens are coming down everyone's screaming and <laughs> mass hysteria and then they were like you know was that was that just an inadvertent you know fun little story oops a joke or was that a social experiment was that like you know how are people going to react when uh you know the aliens come down you know what happens if we throw out this you know and it really is a religion to a lot of people you know it yeah. is it's something that's very you know it's a heated topic and i i think you're right we're really i think we're just going to see more and more of this come out you know they've they've been sprinkling like this idea for a while but mm -hmm. i think at, especially as technology starts to you know technology is going to get crazy in the next few years i mean even just since we were kids, you know, if you think about cell phones and all the tech that we have now and how we're going to have smart cities and they really want to roll out everything. And so, um, you know, I feel like it's going to get to the point where we're just going to be looking, we're not going to be able to recognize what our planet's going to be like. <laughs> well, they've been putting out breadcrumbs and I, I agree with you on this. Like, it seems like I remember NASA comes out and I always thought it was weird that people that that question wasn't more burning like I, I always it's like you're floating on a rock through the flying through the cosmos like literally a rock flying through the cosmos and you yourself meaning us human beings come from this rock evolved on this particular rock you have creatures that evolved in volcanic pits like like you know these insane temperatures you have beings that grow in those particular pits and the very next question becomes, well, wait a minute. If beings can grow in those conditions, beings grow pretty much anywhere. I mean, life becomes ubiquitous. It's like, what rationale do I have to not believe that life would evolve somewhere else in the same way it evolved here? And it's like, that seems, and yet that was one of those questions that people didn't really hit on. People just kind of put their heads down and just did their jobs and not really paid attention to that stuff. And that question always plagued me it's like how can you people not care about this and then it's this other thing of um it seems like the information was being leaked like a little bit at a time so nasa will come out and says hey we found water on the mars it's like okay uh, you know they've always say if you find water there's a likelihood of life and even that is a little weird because it just means the likelihood of life like us life can be some of anything and then they're like hey we found this rock that's coming from some other solar system. This is the first visitor from another solar system. Look at this rock in the sky, it's shaped weird. Like 
these type of questions or these type of things. And then it's, oh, by the way, they're aliens now. What? What? <laughs> You've been studying that? What? <laughs> it's like that. The progression of this, with a small amount of information being released or titrated, like for the past 50 or 60 years, where they just kind of figured, if we say this, it would destroy the planet. People will not know how to act and people will flip out. So we're going to distribute this information a little bit at a time. It's, yeah, it's, that's that's the narrative I've heard, you know, that they were like, okay, well, 1947 or whatever, you know, there was the first, you know, interactions. And then from there... It was, you know, we need to leak this out slowly over the next how many years because people are going to freak out. They're There's a book out. Uh, called uh, Behold a Pale Horse by Bill Cooper. And he claims yes. to have had like the inside intel that said, you know, it's been going on since 1947 and we got all this crazy technology. And now it's basically like, you know, shadow government um, trying to figure out how to leak it out without you know, people going nuts, I guess. <laughs> the stabilizing country. Uh, do you think it would stabilize the country? Do you think if, if that information was leaked that people would flip out? Or do you think there are, people are more reserved than that? Like, how do you think the public will react to that information? I'm curious about this. I, I, I got to be honest, because I'm curious about this myself. I, I, I Oh, man, I, I have this, I have mixed feelings about it. So, Part of, when I first when I first looked into this, my thought was, well, the public needs to know. The public needs to know. The public must know this information. And after getting into politics for the past year or so, I thought to myself, maybe the public doesn't need to know. Like, <laughs> like, do, it's like, do people have the capacity to deal with this information? I personally, I love the topic. I think the topic is fucking amazing. But can everybody else who are stuck in these religion, this religious paradigm or a political paradigm or paradigms about their race, sexuality, all this other stuff. Will those people be able to deal with this information? Yeah, I, I, I'm torn because it's like part of me is like people are so apathetic about anything and everything now that maybe people wouldn't care. You know, I think a certain group of people would be like, oh, we're a global community now. Let's let's be nice. But I also know like humans and our uh, our natural inclination towards conquest and being really terrible, you know, to everyone that we perceive as an outsider. So, you know, that's that was one of the other arguments that were like humans as a species aren't spiritually evolved to like deal with with having to deal with, you know, other sentient beings, you know, if you just look at how we treat each other, you know, that's a, there's like that weird theory that we're basically in quarantine, that the planet earth is in quarantine because we suck and all the, all the other <laughs> aliens are like, don't let them out of the cage until <laughs> they figure out their own lives, you know, up, which, yeah. you know, seems kind of, uh, you know, it Those sounds far out, apes. but it, it seems rational, you know. <laughs> Those apes. Those apes on that planet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Speaking of that, the social experiment. So do you believe the thing in how Hawaii was a social experiment? I don't see how it can be. I mean, like he just said, like he just messed up on so many different levels. Like, I don't know if it was supposed to be. Like if it was covering for something else that was happening in Hawaii at the same time, or it was a social experiment to see how people would react, you know, how it, I getting it, one of those crazy text messages. Like they said that the, the guy who signed off on that happening, like you have to put in like three or four different passwords and um, he didn't so shut bizarre. it down. And I, I don't know if it was like a cover for something else, or they're just trying to create a, a you know, a ruckus. It, it doesn't like, make any sense. It's like one large red button. And he just hits that one button and then it's texture. It's just so bizarre. It's like how we used to let a message to Hawaii saying that they were under attack. It's so bizarre. So, so bizarre. So let me go back to the original question because we we, we flew into the weeds. <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> um, is there anything you want to tell the audience? Like, is there any... um? Is there anything that you've been either discussing on our show? Is there anything that you want to tell about your show? For example, when people can find you, how people can donate to your content. Oh, um, nice line up there. Yeah, so I've got my super tech here. If you guys want to join, I got my Patreon <laughs> or this is my PayPal here. 
And uh, yeah, check out my channel. Um, I do, Jamal and I do a lot of similar work, you know, pretty similar topics. And, um, you know, I try to put out stuff pretty often. And you and I, we've been talking about for months trying to do a chat together. So hopefully yeah. I can get you on my fault. channel sometime. No, I mean, it's so, there's, there's like six or seven people that it's just like, juggling i'm like oh wouldn't it be great if we talked or you know this is hard this is basically a whole other job that we're doing and making it up as we go along you know it's kind of special to yeah. have that opportunity but it's also you know like hurting cats sometimes between <laughs> all of us you know so well, thank you no, thanks no, for having me on well but yeah i always consider it the other woman that's the way i always count it um my, my wife is like the other woman uh, at this point um do you have time for a few questions from the audience? I won't keep you long. Uh, yeah, if anyone's to. got questions, that's cool. Let's let's take a look. Right. Let's see. Guys, anybody have any questions for Holly? Feel free to ask them now. Um, so foreign policy with, with Trump. Well, it, not even just foreign policy. Well, yeah, foreign policy. The North Korea. So this is weird for me, and this is interesting for me. They're now having talks. North Korea and South Korea are having talks with this idea of trying to resolve their issues. Do you think that Donald Trump being belligerent and gross in some way incentivize these guys to actually get together? <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's like, is it, you know, these guys have been at war for the past, what, 70, 80 years at this point, like a Cold War. And oftentimes Americans don't remember the North Korean War. Um, but we still had troops on those on that border, and, and technically, those two countries were still at war. Is it very possible that Donald Trump, being that gross and over the top, incentivized those two countries to actually talk about reunification? You know, I think that's actually like a valid theory. There, I haven't heard that theory yet, but it seems to make sense to me. Um, though, you know, we've been what north uh north korea since the 50s like it's been like technically a detente like we haven't even ended the war over there and we've you know totally propped up south korea and uh, north korea is right on the chinese border so you know north korea and china have been kind of helping each other out and we've been over there supporting uh south korea for all this time and i just think that um so kim jong Un, right? That's Kim Jong Un. Yeah. yeah. He he is my age, so like he's obsessed with like Dennis Rodman and like American <laughs> culture, like and his dad had like the world record for Hollywood movies and stuff. Like it's so weird like the whole story of that family and I think Kim Jong Un actually loves American culture. So I think, you know, he he's trying to be all tough with like blowing up everything and I, I don't know. I think I think Trump calling him like Rocket Man was kind of oh, hilarious. Man. You know, that was like, so funny. That was so funny. Right? Like it's so inappropriate, but it's like it's funny and inappropriate. I, I guess, and that's maybe that's the problem with Donald Trump, man. Like he's the stuff that he does. If it was a reality show host, perfectly okay. Like because it's a reality show host, but he's not a goddamn reality show host. He's the president of the United States. It, it would be like. If you were watching a television show of somebody playing the president of the United States and he goes and he's calling a world leader rocket man and he's threatening to blow up the country talking about my nuclear button is bigger than yours. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> like, I, like, it's mind blowing to know that a president is doing this. All right. So Jen Choi asks, Holly, what are your plans for expansion in 2018? Oh. Hmm. Well, I have like a research project I want to work on, like maybe a book or something. I've got some ideas, um, hopefully growing my channel more. People are complaining about my studio in the comments. So yeah, maybe moving my studio, like, uh, you know, uh, making it a little bit better in the future, learning how to uh, use my editing equipment that I have. Like I have like an editing program on my computer now. And I've just been too scared to like really touch it. So maybe <laughs> learn something like that. I don't know. Let's see. So my, you know, it's, uh, man, I love talking. I love this conversation because you, I, I think we hit our heads on similar things. 
like like I said, both of us started around the same time. And I, I remember <clears throat> I remember finding your channel. And I was like, oh, she just started too. And it was like beyond her just starting too. I was like, th there was this little bit of slight competition in me, like, like, oh, she's, you know, I I I, it's like both of us are starting around the similar finish line or starting point. I, oh, no, man. I love it. I love it. I think it's awesome. Um, let's see. Uh, how do you guys feel about Trump's solar tariff? Oh, good question. Unlikely ally. Yeah, I am. Uh, I mentioned I was kind of torn on it because um, I think uh, – I don't know. I think it could go either way. Like in theory, uh, putting a tariff on solar panels, like I looked up like the mainstream, like liberal news is like Trump hates solar now. You know, he hates green technology. You know, he hates the planet and everything like that. Um, but I, I don't know. Hopefully it will force other companies within the U.S. like to we need to start purchasing U.S. solar panels and maybe bringing in opportunities for solar panels to be built into the United States because the tariff was on Chinese solar panels. And I'm a big fan of tariffs. Like that's how the U S really built up our manufacturing uh, history, you know, in Portland, Maine, where I live, we have a beautiful customs house and uh, it's basically just a museum now, but it's right on the water. And that's how we used to take in money, you know, from all these ships and, and foreign goods and all these uh, tariffs have been chipped away. And, you know, NAFTA totally killed uh, that whole idea through like free trade. And that didn't benefit the US and it didn't certainly didn't benefit Mexico. Like, um, the idea is completely ridiculous to keep that going. So I think the the tariff thing was, you know, maybe he could have started with something that Democrats might not have attacked, like solar panels. Like he also put a tariff on washing machines too, and people don't really care about washing machines. So, but Whirlpool was like, we're going to expand now that, um, you know, the foreign competition is going to have to pay a tariff and we're going to be able to build more. Yeah, I, I saw the story last night. Um, I I agree with, uh, yeah, I, agree. I, I don't know all the re repercussions of it, which is why I haven't done an article or a video on it yet. But the basic premise of it, yeah, I agree. I, I remember Van Jones, um, I remember this years ago, this was like on CNN or something. Van Jones was being attacked by a conservative talking about, uh, I think it was Solyndra. And Van Jones made the point that the reason why Cylindra failed was because, and this was, yeah, this was like, this, oh man, this was a long time ago, was because China invested so heavily in solar power that it just kind of drained the market or swamped the market. The United States businesses couldn't compete with it. If that's true, and one of the ways that helping your particular country to compete in this is adding a tariff. And like you said, we used to we used to run the country on tariffs. So I don't necessarily think it's crazy that the United States puts a tariff on solar power if you want to improve the solar power market in the United States. It's like he's trying to balance the scales to some degree. But again, it's like, what are the long-term repercussions to that? Like, what does that do in a larger context as opposed to just those particular things? And you're also right. Democrats are like, Trump hates solar power. Trump probably does hate solar power. Trump is probably agnostic towards solar power. Um, but they were going to attack him regardless. They're going to attack him regardless of what he did. And and the, the smaller nuance of this of, well, wait a minute, American manufacturers are actually going to be emboldened by this, gets missed. It totally gets missed. Uh, yeah. Let's see. I think you're right, though. Like when you talk about tariffs, like I think that's something that both the right and the left could agree on, you know, as a green, like the idea of tariffs makes makes sense to me, you know, uh, not so favoring a foreign competition if we can be putting people to work in the United States and hopefully doing it green and, you know, not polluting our planet and our country in the in the meantime, like it needs to be smart and done the yeah, right way. Agreed. But the right and the left, Agreed. like we should all be on on this idea of bringing back tariffs. I think I don't know. The other other side of the coin is that Canada and these other countries are like, well, we're just going to join the TPP, and uh, 
you know, that, that was kind of like the response where they're like, if America starts to do tariffs and starts to isolate itself, the one world, you know, global corporation yeah. is going to start going without us. And that's the catch. It's like, of it. And it, it's weird, man. I mean, we've made the argument, the TPP, NAFTA, it, it's, those aren't trade deals. Ultimately, those deals are just these kind of corporate giveaways. And I think you're seeing what's taking place now. So it's like Trump is saying, we want to protect America's industry or solar power industry. And the rest of the world is like, screw that. Screw that. I mean, even talking about taking us to court over this from the World Trade Organization. So we've had to change our laws before um, when we've lost the World Trade Organization. I think it was tuna. It was something about our fishing nets where Mexico was saying that they couldn't compete with our dolphin safe nets. And so the United States had to pass a law or change our law to accommodate that particular ruling. We, we lose a certain amount of sovereignty um, with these trade deals. And I, and I think depending on the world's perspective on what takes place, it's going to get that across immensely so. Meaning if Donald Trump is punished by the world community for, for doing something that protects American trade, I think that's going to make America more against the trade, if that makes sense. It not, But it depends. Democrats are, are traitors in this regard because they're just going to put politics ahead of anything else. So they're probably going to attack Trump on this thing. See, the rest of the world said that they don't like your trade policy, so you need to make your policy more in line with what the rest of the world needs. Yeah, exactly. They're like rolling out Trudeau and they're like, oh, well, Trudeau is going to sign the TPP and yeah. everyone loves Trudeau. So, you know, Trump's a jerk for not signing TPP like that, as if that's an argument. <laughs> yeah. And like I said, this is one of those things I agree with Trump on. When Trump got in office, and he put a bullet in the TPP. I was like, good job, Donald Trump. Now, the rest of the stuff, not so much. But it, in that very specific point, I agree with him on. I agree with him on. Let's see. Is there anybody else? Uh, we have a lot of these questions. Um, let's see. Let's get one more. One more good one. Um, uh, they're talking about tariffs. Let's see. What is? What are your doves' names? That's not a good one, BB. No. What? Uh, um. Let's see. What it does is lay off. Ah, uh, come on, come on, come on. Let's see, the people who don't make, no, that's not one. All of the others, no, that's not one. I'm trying to find a good one. All right, so what about, everybody's talking about the, <laughs> everybody's talking about um, the tariff thing. Well, that's good. You know, maybe uh, I would like to see you uh, do a video, like not to put pressure on you at all, but you seem to have some, some good ideas about that idea. And, uh, you know, uh, you you brought up like I, stuff I hadn't ever heard of, like the idea of like the tuna and all this other sort of stuff, you know, that I think yeah. people don't even know what a tariff is. You know, I didn't know what it was until pretty recently either, which is so crazy, you know, because I considered myself as someone who uh, knew quite a bit about government and politics. And uh, I think people need to start looking at this idea of how do we bring back American manufacturing or something, bring something, agriculture, you know, uh, bring back organic farming, something. We need something for America right now. Agreed. Agreed. How do you bring American manufacturing back? I'll ask that question. But if, let, and let's say from the Greens perspective, Republicans are ridiculous on this. I don't think Democrats have any ideas at all. So, as a Green, what is, and maybe the Greens don't have just a standard playbook for this, a standard idea for this, but how do you bring back jobs? And and are jo is jobs the thing that you need to bring back? I yeah, so. I think, uh, you know, the ideas of uh, starting to dismantle, like, the big, giant uh, agriculture, like, farming, the big pharma, the big ag agriculture, we need to start having smaller scale. Like, I don't know if we can provide, like, you know, of course, like Jill Stein and her Green New Deal has this idea of putting in a president who would do something like alphabet soup, like what um, 
uh, FDR did, where it's like we need to start using money to invest into local opportunities. You know, that could be a Republican way could be to just uh, give less money to the federal government and more to state governments. And then the states can can divvy out how they want to start growing food. Um, I think that should be a huge huge uh, concern for us. It's only going to get worse if you think about all the fires in California. And I know, you know, living in Maine, we still get the majority of our food from California. It's ridiculous. Really? Like that's the main state. Yeah. It ships all across the United States. And, you know, we're, we're starting to be more agricultural, like small farms, like people are starting to get into that. There's a market for that, like um, farm to table and people want to buy organic you know, despite the price, but we still take in majority of our food from the big ag, you know, Midwest, California, and between all of the terrible things going on in California, we need to start focusing on how we're going to be able to feed people in the next couple of decades. So that should be a big investment. And uh, like we were talking about before, you know, if we can be creating green tech opportunities, you know, instead of just something like smart cars, like, I know it sounds far out, but, you know, there are water power cars out there, like that technology does exist. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, agreed. Agreed. I, I like, um, yeah, I like this idea. It, the problem, I think part of the problem is that neither party talks about this. Like when you're oftentimes they use jobs as this kind of buzzword just to attack the other party with and scare people. It's like, hey, we're going to take put your you know, we're going to bring back jobs. Well, they're just using it because people need jobs to support themselves. Like it puts a pressure on the public by scaring the shit out the public like jobs. What are you talking about? My job, my job is at risk. Like it, it's they use this stuff as a political stunt without ever actually talking about ways of bringing back those jobs. Like they just say we're going to bring back jobs without really full well getting into any real explanation on how they're going to do that. So one of the like, audience uh, members just said hemp and uh, marijuana, you know, that's, I totally forgot about point. that. That's a huge, huge market that's growing despite all of the limits that's being put on, you know, by local governments, by the fed still fighting it. You know, what was it? Someone in Trump's administration who like yeah, doesn't true. want marijuana legalization to go forward. I mean, the floodgates are opened at this point. And when someone's talking about hemp, you know, the possibilities are endless with hemp and, we used to be a country of hemp growers and uh, you know, it sounds crazy to some people, but we've got hemp Crete, hemp oil, you know, hemp seed, hemp clothing, hemp paper, like everything, you know, hemp plastics. Uh, we could totally be rebuilding and fixing this planet. And we talk about how there's too much carbon and we need to do carbon credits. Well, the way that you can get CO2 out of your, atmosphere is to plant more green things, plant more trees, plant hemp. And that's, yeah. that's, that's a, lot, a big part of the solution, but people don't want to talk about solutions. Like you're right. People, the Democrats and Republicans want to be spinning their wheels for the next hundred years. And uh, if you talk about actual solutions, then you're crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like, Oh, that guy, he just wants a pony. <laughs> that guy wants a pony. Um, yeah. Holly, I really appreciated this. Um, and I know my audience appreciated it. Uh, they seem to appreciate it for the most yeah, part. Yeah, that was awesome. We got we we had like over a hundred people watching at one point. So Great. that's cool. Nice. Woo! That's awesome. I mid like 420, we're talking about hip though. Yeah, you know, yeah. The hip thing, I do you think Jeff Sessions is gonna be able to put real pressure on the states at this point? I mean, what? It's like quarter of the states or one fourth of states in this country have legal legalized pot in some way you think he's going to be able to roll back the clock i just i think it's completely 100 percent ridiculous like i don't know if he's being pressured by big pharma or big alcohol you know like they are you know those are the two main groups like uh, alcohol sales and companies and like big pharma are pretty much i mean maybe oil too like maybe he's just doing lip service but this is have been marijuana is completely 100 percent bipartisan at this point you know when i worked to try to get marijuana legal in my town it was like libertarians greens yeah. independents you know some rogue democrats and republicans nothing official from the two parties they didn't want to get officially involved but 
everyone wanted it wanted it to be legal like we had a, a lot of people signing up like as soon as the polls opened at eight o'clock in the morning there were like young people <laughs> wanting to go and vote which you'd never see so i think i think you know he he must be playing lip service like it sounds completely ridiculous at this point <laughs> yeah but my wife and i were in um amsterdam and it was like early early in the morning i think we got there at like seven o'clock seven or eight o'clock and we were just enough time where we can get to the coffee shop. And there were people full, coffee shop, completely full, full of stoners. Like, it's like from wall to wall. Where it's like, it's like 8 o'clock in the fucking morning. What are you guys doing? It oh, my a, goodness. It was awesome. And, and it's one of those things where when they legalized pot, drug use or other drug use went down. So... You know, it wasn't this thing where they legalized pot and all of these gateway drugs and people start doing heroin and then, you know, freaking out in the public. It was kind of the opposite. The drug use, for the most part, set old drug use down. It was a fascinating thing. Um, and Portugal, if I'm not mistaken, legalized all of their drugs. So, but it, it's, just, it's insane that we're putting people in cages for plants. I think that's massively insane. Um, if I am not mistaken, I think it was there were more people in jail for pot than all other violent crimes combined. I think it's oh, amazing. wow. That's an amazing number. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, Holly, I'm going to let you go. Somebody was like, Jamal's going to have Holly here for another three hours. <laughs> uh -oh. So I'm going to let you go. I've had interviews that went for like three hours. One of, I had um, Joe Firestone on. Firestone, him and I talked for like four hours. <laughs> he's, he's awesome. He's absolutely awesome. <laughs> Yeah, right, I'll so, have to have you on my channel sometime. That would be fun. Uh, absolutely. I, anytime you want me to come on, just let me know. Thanks, okay. everyone. Thanks, Jamal. Thank you. All right, guys. That was Holly Siegler, Zoo on Politicon. Um, I am going to let you guys go. I want to thank everyone for showing up. Your participation is immensely appreciated. So you guys have a good night. If you enjoy the content, feel free to share, like, subscribe. And of course, you always can support the work of the Patreon. Thanks, guys. And we.